Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast, episode number 56, Jenna Waller and Skullbound TV. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hi, this is Jackie Bushman of Buckmasters. You're listening to my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Welcome to the show, everybody. This is your host, Jay Scott of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Welcome back to another episode. I am here and joined by my good friend, field correspondent from Ohio, Dusty Phillips. Dusty, what's going on? Not a whole lot. What's happening with you, Jay? Now, you say it not a whole lot every single week. I don't believe you, man. You're right. You know, it just takes me a minute to open up and get in my head exactly what I need to be telling everybody that's going on. All right. Well, yeah. you, you just told, got done telling me a story pre Pre, pre-chat you just got in a big fight with a big tire yeah you gotta love tractor tires but you know it's not all about tractor tires we need to be talking hunting well hold on I, I, did you win or lose you know uh, we're, we're not talking about that we're, we are moving on to hunting jay come on man now you know you shouldn't avoid a subject matter <laughs> i can tell it's a sore spot if you're just trying to avoid it's like avoiding eye contact uh, i whipped it you know all right what good. do you say i, I just manhandled it and got it taken care of and it's a done deal now we're moving on you know this weekend i think i'm putting some mineral out i'm gonna do a couple of videos on putting out mineral nice that's cool i think we should get some mineral out um i got a fancy package in the mail and i finally sent out that package i promised you of a few dvds that um i promised you about six months ago <laughs> finally they are headed my way yes yes they are awesome you know that's cool and i'm glad you didn't forget about it and uh I'm sure Elton there at uh, About Time Outdoors will appreciate the DVD when I get it in his hand. I hope so. But play with him a little bit. Just uh, see if you can get him to get a little agitated or something before you hand it over. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I couldn't see it doing any other way. Yep. Uh, hey, what's going on at Chubby Tines on the Facebook page? You know, it's pretty much the same as it's been. We're, we're getting a lot of velvet bucks, and, uh, you know, people are starting to get out in the woods a little bit. It's hard to believe that they are there because of the ticks and, you know, the chiggers and everything that's out there right now that people's actually getting into the woods, you know. But I just had a monster, a monster of a pickup. It was a 172 net buck. It was it was a nice, nice chubby tines. That's awesome. Very nice. It, yeah, you know, I think that uh, they was bailing hay or something and come across it. And your um, the weather this past week in Ohio was like almost fall-like, right? It was like 48 degrees one morning. Yeah, I, Wednesday morning it was it was uh, about 40, 47. Hmm. So I, I got up and I went outside and I started putting my hunting riggings on. I'm like, oh, this, it ain't time yet. <laughs> yeah, but it's <laughs> it felt like it. Man, I, I kind of got the bug this morning. I could use a little break from this humidity we're having in New England. I would love to have a little bit of that 48-degree crisp, cool weather come my way for just a few days. That's all I want. Yeah, it was one of the mornings that the, the dew was real strong. You know, you could be real quiet getting in the woods. It was just a dream morning to go to the woods. But, you know, in all reality, I was headed to work. Boo on that. Very nice. Very nice. Well, we've got a uh, fantastic guest on the show, as we do each and every week. And uh, this week we're talking to Jana Waller. Yeah, Jana Waller with Skullbound TV. She's uh, She is a hunter. She, she is an artist. Phenomenal she, artist. Phenomenal artist. She is a she. And uh, I don't know if you've seen the headlines lately, but female hunters are getting a awful lot of attention lately. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's starting to become more and more uh, a focus on the huntress in the outdoor community. Yeah. And they're getting a lot, you know, who's giving them a lot of attention are the anti hunters across the board. For some yeah. reason, they're targeting the lady hunters for some reason. I think they're jealous. Jealousy plays a big role in, in anti-hunters. I, I got a feeling. Something. I don't know. So Jenna is a big hunter. She's a big fisherman. She uh, travels all across the, the continent, and she uh, plays in her backyard of Montana. And she is uh, going to tell us her whole life story and her story about her TV show uh, coming up here in, in just a few seconds. So I don't know if you've uh, got any other further comments, Dusty, but I'd like to get to this interview. Yeah, let's uh, let's get to it. I'm excited. All right, let's get Jenna. 
Jenna Waller, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Well, thank you very much. I'm excited to be here and uh, chat hunting. Me too. I like talking hunting. Um, Me too. And I like I like talking to people that know what they're doing. <laughs> and uh, well, I, uh, I know a little bit about a lot, not a lot about a little. So uh, we'll uh, we'll definitely have some interesting convo. Very cool. And one of the things that I I'm realizing is that I learn from people as I talk to great hunters like yourself. And I, I always uh, put one new thing in my cap when I hit the field the next time. Exactly. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, exactly. That, I feel that way about everybody I talk to, about hunters and even non-hunters. Um, I'm, a, I'm a chatter myself, and I uh, definitely can learn a lot from everybody. So I'm looking forward to our talk. Me too. All right. So, Jenna, tell me about yourself. I want to learn well, a, a lot about you. Where are you, yeah. where are you? I am right now sitting on a couch in a home in the middle of the mountains of Montana. I moved out here well, roughly four years ago, mm-hmm. but I am um, born and raised in the beautiful state of Wisconsin. I'm a chief head through and through and uh, lived in Wisconsin <laughs> for 38 years. And, I knew um, I recognized that accent. I just it, knew it. Yeah, I know. I, I, yeah, I'm actually quite proud of it, but I think it's so funny how people right away look, stop, pause, look at me, point their finger, and they say, Wisconsin or Minnesota? I get that so much, right. and uh, I'm glad that I haven't lost that. But um, I actually started out hunting, not even hunting, I would say shadowing or tagging along with my dad mm-hmm. in the fest fields in Wisconsin. You know, he, he recognized in me a, a love of nature and loving to be outdoors and just sort of fostered that. And I always joke and tell everybody that when I was old enough to walk the fields without complaining a whole lot, he started to let me tag along on his hunts. And unfortunately, Wisconsin at that time like many states, was uh, 12 years old to hunt. But for years, I would take along with him on duck hunts and pheasant hunts. And he was smart enough to sign me up for hunter safety when I was 12. And uh, we did some pheasant hunting together. We would road trip it to South Dakota. And those were some of my best childhood memories. And um, when I was in high school, my boyfriend was a deer hunter. I wasn't a hunter yet of big game, but I would sit in the tree stands. And that's how it all started for me for a couple of years. And then when I was in college, I met a woman who was uh, another gal, a couple of years older, not, not too much, but just a couple of years older than I was. And she was a bow hunter. And I thought, well, you know, if she can do it, I can do it. And I bought a bow that year, started practicing. And I think I was 20, 19 or 20 when I went out into the woods with uh, a bow for the first time. And after numerous sit, shot my first white-tailed doe and was absolutely hooked with the entire process. The entire process of scouting, sitting in a tree stand, you know, learning the patience that it took. I absolutely loved the whole tracking. Um, I even loved the field dressing. My dad used to joke and say, Jana doesn't field dress her deer. She autopsies them because it's fascinating. (laughs) I mean, when else do you get that opportunity? And um, so that was... 22 years ago, and I've been so I've been bow hunting for about 22 years. Um, real blessed in the last five years of my life to bow hunt all over the the world, really Africa, Canada, um, uh, rifle hunt Alaska, hunt all over the U.S. And um, it's just it's amazing how a hobby turned into a full blown career. That's just the best story ever. Take, <laughs> taking a a hobby and turning it into a career. I mean, that's yeah. that's the great American story right there. Yeah, I mean, I'm truly blessed to be where I'm at. Um, We, you know, I started, before I moved out to Montana and met Jim, I was um, just a passionate hunter like everybody. I lived for the fall, um, would always get cabin fever, of course, all through the winter. So I would, spring would come and I would shed hunt and turkey hunt and anything to get out into the woods. Um, But uh, I was an outdoor writer at that time as well as I I worked for an investment company for 10 years. So I had my, you know, real job, quote unquote. Right, your, and, your paying uh, job. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, right. thank you. There we go. And um, with, uh, you know, white tails were my thing for 15 years, 16 years. And uh, I was lucky enough to have uh, my dad's piece of property that was it's near the Wisconsin Dells. And half the time he would be there as well hunting. Other, other The other times I pretty much hunted on my own and um, just fell in love with, like I said, the entire process of it. And any hunter that you know, I talk to get that. It's the non-hunters that that have a problem with that or they don't understand the whole 
process, the whole idea of getting out in the outdoors, seeing what you see, experiencing nature that you wouldn't any doing anything else. You can say, well, other people say, well, I go hiking and I experience nature. Yeah, but it's not the same. You're not sitting there in the woods for five hours straight trying not to move. The woods come alive around you. Right. And long story short, I started to write for some hunting websites like womenhunters.com and bowhunting.net. That was my foot in the door of the hunting industry, if you will, was writing articles. At the same time I was doing that as a hobby, I was also starting to paint skulls. I loved to, like I said, shed hunt, and I would find whitetail skulls and raccoon skulls and coyote skulls. My dad's property actually had two major highways that went around it, so of course there was a lot of highway kill. And uh, he came back from a trip to New Mexico, and he brought me a photo of a painted ram skull. Hmm. And he said, why don't you start doing this? And my dad and I had always painted as hobby artists together for years. And I'm like, wow, that's really neat. It was kind of painted in a Native American dot pattern design. And so I started painting some skulls on the side for fun. And people would see them hanging in my office or my home and say, oh, I'd like to order one of those for my husband or my boyfriend. Or I started getting a lot of orders. And so then I thought, well, maybe I'm on to something here. And I launched my paintedskulls.com website where I actually used to sell skulls off the site. And one thing led to another. The painting evolved into sort of beading or stoning skulls. I started ordering skulls off websites or hmm. finding them at garage sales or rummage sales from whitetail, elk, bear, African skulls of all kinds, coyote, wolf, and started stoning them and beating them. And that was really unique. You know, I've seen a lot of painted skulls over the years, and there are a lot of really great artists out there. But the beating of them was really different. That's something a lot of people had never seen before. So I think that really caught on. And then um, I met Jim five years ago um, through, uh, actually a funny funny story here. It's embarrassing to say we actually met through Facebook. We, um, whoa, 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 whoa. I, had, I know, right? <laughs> but let me Facebook clarify, lovers. let me clarify, hang on. It's, <laughs> it's, it's not as good as it sounds. I had just written, posted that Bow Hunter just bought an article of mine called Independence Day. It was yeah. about climber tree stands. Yeah. And uh, using climbers, not even to have my dad help me move stand, climber ladder stand, strand to stand. I actually hate height. It, it's a, a battle <laughs> right? every oh, time okay. I'm going. Interesting. Yeah, battle every time I'm going up to my tree stand. So I finally got a, a climber and shot one of my nicest whitetail bucks out of that climber and wrote an article called Independence Day. Well, Jim sent me a message and he said, what issue are you in? They just bought an article of mine called Kingdom of the Brown Bear, hmm. where he filmed a huge brown bear hunt in Alaska with a bow. So we got to talking that way, and we ended up meeting in Nebraska, uh, doing a writer-style hunt for turkeys in Nebraska, and that's how we met. And I'm thinking, well, great guy and everything, but I don't know if I'd ever move away. My whole family's in Wisconsin, and, and so we became good friends, and he kept pushing me, pushing me, come see Montana. You've got to see the mountains of Montana. And I had been to Colorado and Wyoming and some of the other beautiful states in the West, but I flew out to Montana, and I joke about falling in love with not only uh, the mountains, but Jim as well. So that uh, brought me out to Montana and we started our show Skullbound. Um, He was with a different production company that produced outdoor programming on the Outdoor Channel and Sportsman's Channel. And we sort of just collaborated um, and thought, you know, there aren't, there aren't, any at that time, solo female hosted hunting shows um, where, you know, there's a lot of couples shows, but there's really not any shows that have the woman as the main focus and following her adventures. And then we decided to tie in my skull business as well, because people find that interesting, especially outdoor people and hunters. And so he came up with the name Skullbound. We went to SHOT Show and pitched the show idea around. And now we're filming for our fourth season on the Sportsman's Channel. That's awesome. That's so cool. It's a great story. I'd like to break it down a little bit more, if that's all right. You bet. All right. So 20 years ago, you started hunting. Is that Big game hunting, yeah. Big game hunting. Were you hunting prior to that? I was, but more bird hunting, like an okay. occasional pheasant hunt with my dad. Okay. It wasn't until I was in college that I started uh, hunting whitetails. Gotcha. So would you attribute your love of hunting, or at least introduction to hunting, to your father? Absolutely. Absolutely. My mother was always very supportive. 
but she wasn't a hunter herself. You know, she um, always very supportive of our entire family. But yeah, definitely my dad. And the funniest part of the story is I have one sister, uh, no brothers, and I was the second born. And I think my dad wanted a boy so bad that he, you know, of course, was feeling blessed with a daughter, but recognized in me that I was, you know, as gung ho as any little boy would be to pick up that fishing rod or walk the fields with him. Or he, I remember my my earliest childhood memory was begging my mom to let me wait in the garage with my big rubber boots on because I knew my dad was out. She says catching ducks. Catching I ducks. I love that. Don't you love that? Catching, hey, did you catch anything ducks. today? It's right. <laughs> And he brought home a couple of uh, ducks, and I used to love the smell of them. Mm. As funny as that sounds, anyone who's been a duck hunter knows, you know, ducks have a great smell. You just bury your face in their feathers, and they smell great. And that's one of my first childhood memories. And I think he just got a huge kick out of that and really encouraged that throughout my childhood. Hmm. Interesting. What was your father like? My dad is one of my best friends. And uh, I feel really lucky to say that, you know, being a woman, I'm proud to say I'm 42 years old and I don't know a lot of other women who are my age who consider their dads one of their best friends. When right. something exciting happens, I call my dad. You know, I get this, you know, dad, I just shot a great bear. Or, hey, dad, you know, he's one of my best friends. And it's not just hunting. It's, it's, it's everything. Right. But I attribute it to that connection that of the, the hunting connection, the love, love of fishing, plus the artwork connection that we have. And he is, not only that, he's one of the funniest guys around. I mean, he's just... Hmm funny. Anything that you a little bit politically incorrect at times, but funnier than funny. Oh, I love politically incorrect fathers. They're oh, the best. Oh, you, <laughs> They're the best. You'd love them. So is your dad an artist as well or is he where does the art side of you come into play? He's an artist, but just as a hobby artist. Okay. He was a businessman. He actually started out his career. He was um, a high school principal. He was only in mm. that job of maybe four or five years and uh, felt frustrated with the politics of education. And he ended up starting a sales repping group that repped print circuit boards. And um, as time went on, he actually purchased one of the board houses in outside of Milwaukee in Oak Creek. Okay. So he was a businessman his whole life, but he always had, you know, passion for his hobbies and his hobbies being fishing, hunting, golf, and artwork, if I had to name the top ones. And he's always uh, loved to paint, more so in his retired years. Um, he's in his, love to say this, props to dad, he's 70 two, maybe 73. Right now I have to do the math. But he, um, he, when he, in the last, I would say 15 to 20 years, he's really picked up his painting again. Um, not so much when I was at home under their roof, but he paints everything from wildlife paintings to Native American paintings, portraits, just for fun, for hmm. people. And he loves to give them away. And, gotcha. um, yeah, and we took a couple classes together at the Senior Center in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin yeah. out in the summers just to have fun and spend time together and hone in on our skills. But uh, he's just a hobby artist, but again, it's, it's very inspiring to me. That's excellent. Now, what was high school like? <laughs> Did you hang with um, a crowd? Were you in a clique? I wouldn't say I was a, in a clique. I don't like cliques. I've never, you know, been someone who thought of myself as a popular kid by any means. Okay. I really liked kind of everybody. Um, I had a core group of girls, of course, that we would hang around. And it was funny, that group of girls isn't like today. I get really excited when I, I've got a friend, uh, Rachel from Fort Atkinson, who is who, in high school. She's a little hunter and her friends are hunters. And that wasn't my high school. It wasn't it wasn't because it wasn't cool back then like it is now. I think there's a, a you know, energy now about being a young female hunter that's very positive and I think that's wonderful. But when I was in high school, I was in into sports. I was I played soccer. I was uh, on fre in freshman year. I was a pom pom girl. Yeah. But uh, I loved soccer. I loved my friends, and uh, I was pretty normal. I don't know. I don't definitely not into the clicky thing though. Okay. So you just <laughs> you, you you had a, a good high school career. And what did you do after high school? You do military? Did you go to college? I went to college. I went to the same college both my parents met at, or they went to and met, um, UW-Whitewater, Wisconsin. Okay. It was only the town over from Fort Atkinson where I grew up. But I went to Whitewater. I studied public relations and health and majored in it and graduated in 1993 mm -hmm. and uh, loved college. I had a great time in college, lots of friends. Um, college again, is great, isn't it? It's a lot of fun. Oh, my goodness. 
isn't it a wonderful time in your life? Really I wouldn't is. want to go back there. Um, you know, I don't think anyone in college really, I, this is my joke about people. I don't think anyone even really knows themselves until they get into their 30s. Right. And it even gets better in your 40s. I wouldn't trade my 40s for the world. I feel like, especially women, and maybe some people would argue with me, but we, we come into our own in our 30s and 40s. And, you know, instead of maybe trying to be other things, um, I wouldn't trade where I'm at in my life for anything. And right. I, even though I loved college, I wouldn't want to go back there. I, I agree. And, and college was fun. And I always uh, I listen to kids that are in college today and they're telling me how hard it is. It's like you 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 have no idea how easy it is. <laughs> right. <laughs> wait wait till life to smacks on, you in the face. Yeah, right. Exactly. You right. get to focus on school a lot of, and of course, you know, you might have a job at the same time, but I don't I don't wouldn't call college the quote unquote real world. No, um, no. It's a very much a bubble. Yeah. And right. but yeah. I think I think you're right. I think when you get in your thirties and your forties, you really become yourself and yeah. you start to develop that you know that in political or uh, politically incorrect side of you really emerges. Yeah. And that's, yep. you, you look at your parents and like you become your parents. It's kind of funny. Oh yeah. I think so too. I, and I, uh, I think I'm a good mix of my mom and dad. You know, my, I definitely, my, my outdoorsy side comes from my dad. My artwork comes from my dad. My sense of humor definitely comes from my dad. I've <laughs> got to watch that sometime. Right. My mom, on the other hand, she's just a wonderful person. She's got a wonderful heart, doesn't have a negative thing to say about anybody. Um, you know, I hope I have a lot of her in me. I look a lot like my mom. Everybody, it's funny. All her friends from college like to watch me go through life because I look so much like her. But, um, you know, I, uh, I'm really blessed. I've got a wonderful family. And my sister, who, oh, is completely opposite of me, by the way, which is really funny, too. We, I joke that she only goes outside to get to her car. Right. Um, she completely not outdoorsy, doesn't like to hunt, fish, anything like that. But she found her niche in life, and that's being a mom. She's one of the most wonderful mothers I know. She has three kids, um, and I just respect her so much for finding that and diving into it. She's very active in her church. She's very active at the school, and, and uh, it's so funny how different we are, but how much love and respect we have for each other. That's awesome. It's so cool yeah. to, to have good relationships with your parents, and uh, not everybody is fortunate like that. But that, when you have it, you should cherish it. There's no question about it. Absolutely. It's, yeah, I feel really, really blessed to have the family that I do. What kind of camouflage do you normally wear when you're hunting? Um, I'm really proud to be with Cryptech. Cryptech is a newer camouflage company. They've only been out about four years. They were designed by Butch Whiting and Josh Cleghorn. And I think together they have 18 years military experience. They designed a camo pattern. They designed the pattern itself after military netting used to hide tanks and vehicles and such. And their slogan, the, from the battlefield to the backcountry, is something that I'm really proud to wear. Jim, my producer, is a former Marine and has really opened up my eyes to the appreciation of our military. I didn't come from a military family. I didn't know very many people that went into the military when I, you know, went into school. I don't, I don't feel like it was until really in the last five years of my life that I've really come to just honor and appreciate our military. And to be able to wear Cryptek and be sort of their female face right now is something I'm really, really proud of. That's really cool. You know, and you know, hats off to our troops. Amen. It, it, do you, I'm going to have you spell that. So we got a clarification on what the name of that camo is. Yeah, it's Cryptek. It's K-R-Y-P-T-E-K. Okay, Cryptek. Gotcha. All right. Yeah. Then just, uh, you know, if somebody's looking for that particular camo, we'd like to have as much information on it as we possibly can for our listeners. Yeah. Is there yeah, a, absolutely. Are, are you using scent cover? That seems to be the new biggest up and coming thing is a scent cover of some sorts. Are you using any kind of scent cover in particular? Not. I do use scent products. In fact, I even have my own Skullbound scent line. We partnered up with Chris Dale, who is a uh, master in scent line manufacturing, and he came up with a line and uh, we field tested it for a couple of years and he's now packaging it as a Skullbound scent line. It has a lot of really unique products in it. One is an odor eliminator, um, which have a lot of us whitetail hunters are all real familiar with using. Um, and then other products that are either cover scents or attractants and one's an apples and acorns. He's got, uh, you have to go on to the persistscent.com has all the scent products on there or you can even find it through the Skullbound TV website. But it depends 
depends on the type of hunting that we're doing, of course. But when I'm tree stand hunting, that's when I use that particular scent line. Um, I'm into a lot of spot and stock hunting here out west. We don't yeah. allow baiting in Montana. I love bear hunting. It's one of my favorite things to do. So we spot and stock bears here in Montana. So obviously really? the use of scent products isn't important. No, no use of dogs or baiting in Montana. So when we go out bear hunting, we our method to our madness is basically using our Onyx maps, finding some great canyons that are public land, great access. We'll either take the Polaris up in them or the truck and just glass, glass, glass. And and in fact, last week, I ha- I happen to be on one of the most exciting hunts I've ever been on. Um, Let's hear it. That, we, you're headed in the right direction. Let's hear this. All right. I had gotten my bear about three weeks ago. A uh, smaller, but beautiful blonde bear. Exciting, but, you know, it kind of happened right off the bat. Wasn't wasn't as exciting as the hunt I'm about to tell you. So, we, Jim and I spent in the last three, four weeks, about nine or ten days in the evenings going out looking for a bear for him. He and I were out the 14th just a few nights ago, and we this was the last night we would have to hunt bear the spring season because it closes on the 15th and we had an appearance all day on the 15th. So, we were up an old logging road. We're in the truck, and we're way up high, and it's about... 6.30, 7 o'clock, and we're using our, our spotting scope, and we're combing apart the canyons. And Jim says, I think I had a bear, but I'm not sure. And I looked through the scope. I said, heck, yeah, that looks like a bear. Look at that. And we're just trying to analyze. It looked like a, that, just a little patch of fur, if you will, of a bear in its bed. But we were way up high in a canyon, and this bear was, of course, way low on another peak. And we're, so we debated, do we drop off? It's about a 1,500 vertical drop off. If we get down there and it's a smaller bear, or if we get down there, it's a solid cub or whatever that may be, we're going to have to hike all the way back up, and that's the end of our hunt. So we said, yeah, why not? Let's drop off. Let's go for it. So we got down there, knowing that it could be that by the time we got down there, that bear could be gone too. But we got down there um, about 45 minutes later. We set up about 200 yards away from the bear. We could still see that it was still in its bed. And we filmed that bear in its bed for another half hour. He would twist and turn and kind of stretch, but never get up out of his bed. So we couldn't tell how big he was. And we're, I have this all on film for next season. It's going to be really exciting to put this show together. So Jim is in the prone position, laying like in between two downfalls, and he's got his rifle stationed on his backpack. He's solid as a rock. He's just waiting patiently for that bear to get up so we can take a really good look. And he's moved around a bit and stretched, like I said, but we haven't gotten a really good look at him yet. But we could tell by the size of his paws. At one point, this bear was licking his paws, and we were like, whoa, I think this is a really good bear. So the bear sits up, and you can hear Jim on camera go, oh, my God. <laughs> and he, he, that bear is sitting there, and it looks like a circus bear. I can see it up through the camera, but he's looking at it through his vortex, you know, his vortex scope. And he places the most perfect shot on that bear. He goes rolling, and we can't see where because it's so thick. But I knew it was a good hit. We get over to this bear, and it's the largest bear Jim has ever shot in 28 years of bear hunting in Montana. This is a seven-foot, beautiful cinnamon bear. And I'm not exaggerating when I say when Jim got up to that bear, he had tears roll eyes because he was so excited about oh. this quality. Uh, this is the kind of bear that's a bear of a lifetime. Right. And um, it's exactly the same bear that I, I don't know if you guys heard about, but so... We posted a picture of the bear on Facebook the next day and talked about the hunt. And in 28 years, it was one of the most exciting moments of our lives, especially Jim's life. And the next morning, I got a notice from Facebook that said, we have removed your post because it violates Facebook community standards. Uh, And then a big big warning underneath that that says you are blocked from Facebook for 24 hours and sort of a warning underneath that if this happens again, you will be banned from Facebook. uh, Oh, and Yep, exactly. And yeah, I and I, I can't believe it, it's very frustrating, you know, the injustice of it all, because there's nothing graphic about that beautiful photograph right. and nothing at all in there about nothing of breaking the community, you know, Facebook guidelines. But again, you know, the antis, they can click they don't like something as much. And I think it just sort of gets flagged in the computer system and they ban you for 24 hours. Yeah. Now, the ban isn't that big of a deal, but that's that's our business. That's our livelihood. And it's also injustice. This is America, you know, the home of the free and the brave. This is the freedom of speech. 
And the censorship, I think, is really sad. And that it's come to a point where there's not even anyone to talk to to say, hey, this isn't right. So the ban disappeared. But I, I believe the, that uh, the outcome the antis were looking for is, is not there because the United States Sportsman's Alliance, I called up Nick Spinozzotto, my friend, the CEO. I told him the story of Facebook banning me for 24 hours. And he wrote a big article about the injustice of it all. And uh, they, that article got shared over 10,000 times on Facebook, picked up by the NRA, the NWTF, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, and many more. And I have to say thank you to all the antis because our Facebook page grew over 1,000 people in two days. I, awesome. I love antis. I mean, <laughs> yeah. we've had them on our, our Facebook page. and <laughs> This is great. you got to hear this. What I like to do, especially when they try to threaten my family, is I will right. take a photo of the letter and I will post it on our Facebook page. Right. And it'll be the, the name and address, and, and believe me, but within, I'd say within an hour, that person's Facebook page is completely overwhelmed and shut down. I love it. I, I love it. I've done the same thing, too. I've done a snap capture of the vile, cool, harassing, threatening comments, which mm-hmm. is against Facebook community standards, right. mind you. Mm-hmm. And I've snap captured those and posted them on my wall as well. And you better believe it. They're gone within, like you said, hours. And I have to just say kudos to everybody on Facebook, all hunters who stand tall and proud and defend one another. And, and uh, what, the, what the antis don't understand is when they do that, it just causes a, a stronger will of the masses. And uh, I think it has the exact opposite effect of what they're looking for. Yeah, and it's, it's always like, I, I forgot the guy's name, but I basically said, okay, that's great. Um, I'd like to introduce you to my 100,000 friends. <laughs> and they yep. go away very quickly. <laughs> I love it. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, so, I love it too. Would it say that it would be safe to say that you love antis? Me? Yes. <laughs> I, I definitely think so. They make my life very interesting. Right. I've, uh, but I definitely have learned how to handle it. Um, you know, four or five years ago when I would get death threats or pretty vile, disgusting comments on my social media, it did, I admit it did upset me. And, it, you know, I'm a right fighter kind of person. And they don't tell me what I'm doing. First of all, I belong to seven conservation groups. I've raised over $27,000 in the last five years with my skull donations to these conservation groups. I know for a fact I give more back to animals and their habitat than any of these antis do. So I can stand tall and strong. And it used to bother me, but now, like just like you guys do, I use them as an example, and it just creates more awareness and rallies the truth. That's it. It, it. it makes them not look anywhere close to what they were attempting to do. And ultimately... Um, what it does is it it makes it harder for them to penetrate our stuff, which is just the best. So keep them coming, I say. We have an answer. One of the best things I saw recently was the exposure of the United States Humane Society. Did you guys read about that? They've been exposed by a group who did a huge study, and they found that their huge budget, budget the money, they millions of dollars they raise every year, they spend 1% of that budget on animals. A lot yeah. of it goes to their high-paid salaries, their vacation home, a lot of the ridiculous court cases that never get anywhere that they instate. And I just think it's funny because if antis truly understood the ways of, of how, how, how everything works, they would understand that there are more animals because of hunters, that we're the stewards of the land protecting and managing our herds and habitat, and they've got it all backwards. Absolutely. If it wasn't for the hunter and the actually the, the group of hunters that formed with the United States to form the regulations that we have and to uh, basically take a piece of the money from every piece of hunting equipment and, and uh, licensing that's sold, right. there would be no animals at all. <laughs> Really, they, right? They, they, they none don't. of them understand that. <clears throat> none of them. Snack. They don't. No, Mm-mm. they don't realize that at all. And it's yeah, there's, there's a whole lot more to hunting than just going out and harvesting an animal. That's right. Right. That's it's often no, no. often never look. Get back into your your hunt strategy. What kind of tree stands are you hunting out of? Are you in ground blind? Are you in hang on? Are you in ladder? Tell us a little bit about your setup. Um. 
I, like I said, I haven't done as much tree stand hunting as I used to, but um, when I do, when I'm back in Wisconsin, um, my favorites are ladder stands. I know they're not the, the, the best as far as mobility goes, but, you know, after 20 years of learning your land, you kind of know, you know, what stands are good to sit in and, and what windy days. And ground blinds aren't my favorite, but I've hunted out of them. I know I'll be hunting out of them here in August in Wyoming on an antelope hunt. If I had to choose, um, I do, I have a couple of climbers that I've gotten pretty used to that I like as well, but I am not a fan of hang-ons. Um, just, uh, <laughs> yeah, I like I'm, a big I'm, platform. I like, right. uh, you should see me duct tape to the tree when I'm up there, of course, and I uh, harness as tight as possible, but uh, not a fan of heights. I just work through it, but uh, <laughs> I haven't had a chance to tree stand on as much since I moved out west because we do a lot of flat stalk. It's not funny, Jay. I don't like hang-ons either. Oh, that's right. You don't like heights either, do you? I forgot uh, I'm not a fan. You know, <laughs> a good, give me a good solid ladder going to the ground. I feel a little better about it. You know what? I, one of yep. my favorite things to do is to get in my, my climber. I actually oh, love my climber no way. more than anything because I can get up so really? high. But I, it, it, it is it is nerve wracking. But here's the reason I like it is because my dad worked for the telephone company for years and years and years, and I used to see him climb telephone poles gracefully. Sure. And to this day, uh-huh. it's like I want to be like my father. So I get to climb up in these trees. They're not telephone poles, but they're like them, and I I get a kick out of that. Yeah, you know? I can see that. That's so, cool. Yeah, it's it's a little weird thing about me. Is there any <laughs> is there any particular brand of tree stand that you use? Um, no, not honestly, no. I I don't have a tree stand sponsor, and um, my climber is a summit. It's done very well for me, especially coming from a woman who's not that comfortable with height. Uh, I feel it's really safe. Um, let me try to think too. I've used a couple of gorillas, but I don't really have a set tree stand company that I work with. Right. Um, I don't get to hunt out of them as much as I would like. Um, like I said, I've got some ground blind hunting coming up. I've done some spot dark bow hunting out west here, but, uh, I would say that my hunts are probably 75% rifle nowadays. Um, being a solo host of a show, I've got to get 13 episodes out of me. And as much as I love archery and have been archery hunting twice as long as I have rifle hunting, it is challenging and it's definitely more difficult to get a really good show on film. I've got actually my kickoff show for next season, though, will be an archery hunt where I take a great huge mountain lion here in Montana with my bow. And I've got another antelope hunt. And of course, I'll be chasing elk around these mountains of Montana all fall. Right on. You know, I enjoy co hosting. You know that, right? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. What? I, I said, you know, I enjoy co hosting. Oh, you do? okay. <laughs> duly, duly noted. Uh. <laughs> He's always trying to get himself on another show. I don't know why he doesn't like being on the show. Hey, what I, is the problem with this? I, I, I love the Big Buck Race, your Big Buck Podcast, but I'm always down for co-hosting something else. Man, oh All right. Well, I'll remember that. Absolutely. You know, and I like to have a good time. Jay, sorry, buddy. If she offers, I'm gone. I hear you. <laughs> All right. You know, she's better looking than I am, Dusty. I'll give you that. Uh, it's, it's not about looks. It's not about that. Uh-huh. <laughs> but uh yeah so what you're saying is skull bounds need need the tree stand sponsor is that can we can we safely say that oh sure yeah you bet i'm uh always looking for good solid companies to work with but i do have to since you brought it up as far as sponsorship i just i am really blessed i've got an amazing team of sponsors and it's nice because Skullbound tv is a two-man band it's just jim and i we have a studio inside our home and it's so nice to be able to keep it simple like that. And that's, I think, part of the key to our success. We were, you know, voted uh, top five best show and best host last year on the Sportsman's Channel. And I think it's because we we do keep it simple. There aren't tons of cameramen. Jim is the cameraman, the editor, the producer. Um, I host the show. We both do our own sales and marketing for the show. We don't work with another company. It's just us. And our sponsors know that, and they like dealing with just us. They don't have to go through a third-party marketing company. It's just us. And I just feel so blessed to be working with companies like Polaris and Nosler and Matthews and Onyx Maps and Vortex. And I've just been super-duper blessed to have amazing companies that have fantastic products and and I'm hoping that, that they see I'm doing a good job for them. I was going to say, that's a pretty cool list of uh, sponsors you got going on there. Those are great products. Yeah, yeah, they really are. I'm really, really proud of that. And um, 
I also, you know, they know I'm going to work hard for them. I, this is what we do for a living full time. Jim and I, we don't have day jobs. This is our 24 seven job and we love it. Love to be able to share our passion for hunting with everybody and hopefully get that message out there that hunting is conservation. We have partnered with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, the Mule Deer Foundation and the National Wild Turkey Federation. Those three partners, and I called it, they're sponsors of our show, but they're partners and we work closely with them in terms of helping to create awareness, show the world what awesome things we hunters do through conservation and what we're doing for the herds and the flocks and the habitat. And I think that's another reason that Skullbone has found its success is because of our message. That's a a strong message. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. um, uh, yeah, we're, We're really lucky to have that platform to show a different side of hunting, you know. And there's a lot of really great hunting shows out there, but I think some of them miss a boat as far as showing the whole, like we talked about earlier, what the hunt is really about. I'm not a trophy hunter, never will be. I'm not also one to say, you know, if I shoot a big buck or elk or a bear, I'm I'm elated about it. But that's not the reason I'm out there. I'm not trying to always get the biggest and best. I'm out there for the whole experience. Um, and I'm also, this season we've got coming up, we're really excited that I've invited some war heroes to hunt with me to not only enrich my life. I mean, every time I meet somebody who's been through hell and back and has come out stronger, I want to be around that person because I'm going to feel more appreciative of everything in my life. And I'm really blessed to have three hunts this year. Two of them I've already done. Um, I went on an amazing turkey hunt with Greg Stubbe. Greg is a 23-year Green Beret, retired Green Beret. He was in um, a terrible battle. Um, actually, if you've heard of the book Lions of Kandahar, that's the battle of Spurwingar that Greg Stubbe was blown up in a Humvee mm. and uh, was in the hospital over a year, survived one of, if not the largest piece of shrapnel to ever go through a human being's body and survive. And um, he's a big game hunter, but he'd never been on a turkey hunt. So we went on a turkey hunt in Kansas and had just a fantastic time. And it was just amazing to be around him for three or four days and hear his stories and his passion for the outdoors, his passion for the military. It was truly inspiring. That's and, great. Uh, then That's I, very cool. Yeah. I'm really excited to put that show together and the National Wild Turkey Federation was involved and and uh, it's going to be really neat putting that together. And then just two weeks ago, I invited Clint Romache over to Montana. Clint is a Medal of Honor recipient. He's only the fifth living Medal of Honor recipient since Vietnam, which will tell you right there how what an honor that that award is. And he went through the Battle of Kamdesh at Cop Keating in Afghanistan. Eight of his men died, and he was responsible for saving lives, not only saving lives, but recovering his fallen heroes. And just to be able to be around him, and uh, hear his story is just incredibly motivating and inspiring. And to be able to share that story with our viewers is going to be really exciting. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, it sounds like Skullbound TV has got some awesome things going on for some awesome people. Yeah, and like I said, I feel really blessed and lucky to have this platform to, to do that, to tell other people's stories, to hopefully inspire other people to become passionate about the outdoors and join conservation groups. And we, I just feel blessed, blessed all around. And, you know, life's short, and I'm going to ride this wave as long as it's in front of me. Well, heck yeah. Heck yeah. Why wouldn't you? Um, right. That's excellent. Now, wh- where do you want to take the show from here? You want to just keep keep growing and, and finding more viewers and things like that? Yeah, well, you know, I love our network. The Sportsman's Channel has been so wonderful to work with. They, I really feel like they're our partners, not just a big entity that puts our show on. They've worked really well, uh, really great with Jim and I. They've been so uh, supportive as far as the show goes. I feel really lucky. I've been included on all their um, advertising lately. It's really exciting to be on the cover of their advertising programming with Sarah Palin and Gunny and uh, Cam Edwards. I mean, that's yeah. a pretty impressive crowd. I was going to gonna say, on that, there with, that's a pretty cool yeah. picture. Sure, you've got uh, yeah. the Gunny. Dusty and I met the Gunny down at the Great American Outdoor Show. Um, okay, and he was parked Isn't next to uh, Cam's studio. Um, so sure. we we waved to Cam. We didn't get a chance to meet him, but we've talked since. Um, yeah, that's a great lineup, and, and yeah. it, Sarah Palin. It's amazing. Have you yeah. actually met Sarah Palin? 
No, I right. haven't. Okay. That It looks like we're all standing there right next to each other. And of course, the beauty of Photoshop. But no, I haven't met Vera. I haven't. I've been gone so much. Jim and I are gone just tremendous amount of time. We don't even really watch TV much. Um, right. I haven't had a chance to catch Amazing America, her new show on Fortune's channel. Yeah. But uh, I've heard it's uh, just a different twist, adding some new programming to the network. And pretty exciting to have a big name like that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't... I'm I'm excited where Skullbound is right now. You know, we're at the top of the charts as far as ratings on the network. Um, we found a nice home on Big Game Wednesday night. I'm proud to be in that lineup with some other fantastic television shows. Very cool. And uh, they just have been great to partner with. Um, I do have another really exciting TV show that we're working on. It would be in partner with Skullbound. Um, it's in the beginning stages right now, um, but if it goes, it, it, it's going to go big. It's Nat Geo slash History Channel yeah, yeah, type programming sure. that Jim would be producing. And I'll just say it, uh, it's going to be pretty exciting. I can't say a whole lot about it, but it is, Ooh. it is involved in hunting and it's about, it's about predators. And, uh, when I can talk more about it, I'd love to come back on the show and, and talk about it with you guys. All right, so uh, we're getting an inside scoop here, and you're not going to share yep. a little a little secret or anything with us right now. <laughs> nope. Not, not going to do it. <laughs> nope. You've heard what I got to say, but I promise you I will come back and tell you more when All I right. can. All right, that's fair enough. We can take that deal. Yep. All right, so you were on Cam and Company. Yep, I was. Yep, talking about the whole Facebook fiasco, yep. Gotcha. How, how, was, how was that? How was that being on that show? Oh, good. I uh, I love, I I think I'm going to make t-shirts that say the world needs a little more Cam and company. I just think his show is fantastic. You know, I don't get to see it as much as I would like, but I love Cam as a interviewer. I think he, he, he's always so easy to talk to mm-hmm. and he brings about topics, uh, brings topics to the, aware, the awareness of the viewers that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise heard about. Whether it's they're talking about, you know, gun control or politics or hunting things or you know, he's the one who saw that Facebook gave me a timeout and put me in a 24-hour timeout. And he's the one who called and said, hey, let's get you on. Let's talk about this. Let's create awareness. I, I love his show. And I'm always a little uh, nervous to go on live radio because of my mouth and my sense of humor. But no, all good. I've been <laughs> on there, I think, I think six or seven times in the last couple of years. And it's always a pleasure to talk with Cam. So. Yeah, he's a good dude. And I, I haven't had a chance to talk to him yet, but he's gonna actually going to be a guest on, on the Big Buck Registry here at some point. Um, Fantastic! Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. I love talking to other podcasters because not only does he is he on TV, but then they turn his show into a podcast on iTunes. And right. that's I discovered that on my ride home, I drove from Pennsylvania back to New Hampshire, and I listened to his whole show for the first time ever. Uh, just it's like a few months ago, when we were coming back from Pennsylvania to New Hampshire. And I got to got listen to the whole three hours, and it was all about the things we had just discussed and we're interacting in down at Harrisburg. So it was fantastic. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I'm i proud of our network and that show for sure. Definitely. Absolutely. Let's get, let's get into a quick hunt here. I, I want to get uh, um, one of your most memorable whitetail hunts. I want to hear one of your hunts kind of in detail. Tell us where you're at, kind of weather conditions, uh, terrain, and let's just run down it. You, know, you ain't got to get full detail, but I'd like to get into one good hunt. One good hunt I've been on or I'm yeah. going on? No, let's, let's, one you've been on, whitetails. Whitetails. Yep. Probably my most memorable whitetail hunt um, would be a hunt, and it sounds funny, it was, I'm trying to think how many years ago, I think, oh, I think it was 10, 11 years ago. It's a hunt I mentioned in the beginning that my proudest whitetail moment is, and it sounds funny to say this, being a bow hunter for, in the tree stands for 20 years, but I hate heights. And I bought that my I asked for a uh, climber tree stand and got it for I think Christmas or Valentine's Day or something. So it sat in the garage for months and months and months. Well, come summertime, I got out and I practiced climbing the trees in the backyard with it because, if you, as you know, using a climber, it is a little nerve wracking when sure. you're not a big big fan of height. Get up to where you want to get up and then strap yourself in. Well, I had finally I was going to take my stand out into this area that I had seen this buck at earlier in the season in Wisconsin near the Wisconsin Dells. And uh, the I started to climb up. It started to downpour on me, and and I'm not a big fan of sitting out in the cold downpour, especially when I got to climb up and down with a with a climber. So I actually climbed back down. I went over and I sat in the ladder stand for the rest of the night. The next two days, it had gone from like 70s during the day. This was in late October. 70s during the day. It had gone from two days of just crappy weather in the 30s, and it snowed. So here I was so excited to try my climber tree stand, and I couldn't climb it. I couldn't use it. But when I climbed up into that ladder stand. 
and I saw this buck about 75, 80 yards away, and he was just sniffing the ground like crazy, kind of doing figure eights in the small little area, and I'm thinking, he's checking doe beds right there. But I got to move that climber when I can. I got to move it over there. There's no way I'm, you know, going to take the chance that that buck might pass through here. Plus, he came in an opposite direction. So I waited the two days or whether I had a full week off. I took that climber and I moved it exactly where I'd seen that buck, a little bit off the trail, where I'd seen that buck work in those beds. And I climbed back up in that stand. It was finally nice enough out where there was no snow or ice. And sure enough, I climb up in the stand. And I have to admit, I wasn't even that high. I was probably 12, 13 feet off the ground. But I'm like, oh, this is good. And I sat down. I had not even pulled my bow up. And here comes this buck. And I'm like, this, I wish I would have had a camera on me because it would have been really hilarious. I'm scrambling to get my bow up in the stand. I unhook my bow. I'm, I don't need, I've got my release on my wrist. I always walk out with it on anyway, but I knock an arrow and here he comes and he's got his nose to the ground. Thank God. Long story short, I pulled back and arrowed this buck and he was only 20 yards when I shot him. He ran off and I, it happened all so fast. I can't even tell you. I couldn't tell you. Yes, it was a solid, perfect hit. I, I, I thought it was. I heard the thump. But I was so jacked and excited. And I looked with my binos. I could see my arrow in the ground. And it was straight up and down. Hmm. And I remember thinking, like, how, okay, like, if I hit that buck, how did my arrow go through the buck and end up straight down? And I'm looking at it, and I don't see blood. But I knew I, I knew I felt great about the hit. I heard the hit. I felt anchored. But I was so jacked. My, I, I have to admit, I get jacked. My adrenaline just goes <laughs> insane. I had to sit down. I was shaking so much. I was so excited. It don't get no better than that. Exactly. So I sat down in the tree stand, and I gave it the half hour, and I carefully watched my watch. I didn't move for a half hour. Of course, where the buck had run, I couldn't see anything past this knob. And I took my time, and I inched my way back down with my climber tree stand all the way to the bottom, still shaking with excitement. And I got over to that arrow, and I was just deflated because there was not a drop of blood on that arrow, hmm. and I couldn't figure it out. I, I knew I heard the hit. I just couldn't figure it out. And I started doing circles and combing for blood, and sure enough, I found blood. And I'm like, okay, whatever. I don't know how that happened with the arrow, but I'm, I'm going after the trail. And I start trailing this buck. And I trailed it up to this one spot and I marked it and I went back to the cabin because I slid a couple hours of daylight. I'm like, I'm just going to sit back. I don't know where I hit this buck. I don't want to push this buck. I'm going to go back to the cabin and get my dad. Well, my dad didn't even have a cell phone, I don't think, at that time. So I waited for him to come up the driveway and he comes walking up and I said, Dad, I, I shot a nice buck. I, I'm pretty sure I got him, I, I, but I'm not positive. You know, I, I di can't tell you exactly where I hit. I was jacked, and but I think it was all good. But it's out of my climber. It's out of my climber. Like, that's what I was most excited about. And sure enough, we went out with the headlamp, and we went just a little far past where I had left that marker. And there that buck was. And the feeling of independence, like I said, and the excitement of not only did I, I did the scouting, I set that tree stand up. I, you know, moved that stand. I did everything myself. And that was my biggest buck to date. And it's, you know, nothing. It's a nice, beautiful 135 inch white tail. We're not talking monster, but it had been my biggest buck to date. Beautiful buck. And I was so excited about it that I still think of that moment. And half the reason I'm elated about that hunt was because I did it all on my own and, and I did it out of that climber tree stand. And I just, it was, it was a feeling of independence for me that I hadn't had in the hunting field yet. Right. That's, it's quite a, a moment of elation when you do it all by yourself, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it really is. And uh, another great buck story, and I'll make this one quick, was a buck that I took. It was a rifle hunt in Kansas last year. I got a really nice eight point this year in Kansas, but last year, we were there. The weather was challenging. We weren't seeing a whole lot of bucks. And, you know, Kansas grows them big, so you're all excited about what you can possibly see. And um, it was, I think, the third, third or fourth day, and we were going through trail camera pictures. And my buddy Scott showed me a picture of this buck, and he said, you know, he's a nice buck, but he's definitely genetically inferior, no brow tines. He's got width, no mass, but he's got a broken leg. But don't feel like you've got to take him. And mind you, we had counted, I think, 20 coyotes already in three days. This is Coyote Central in Kansas. And I thought, right. these, this poor buck is never going to make it through the winter, sliding around on ice and snow trying to get away from these coyotes. If I see this buck, I'm going to take him. Well, when you know, I go out the next day in a brand new stand and sure, break of light, out comes Limpy at 300 yards, limping across the field, over way, the, across the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I put a nice shot on him all on film. He went down and... 
and I'm, I'm proud of that buck because I think that's what hunting is about. I was just as excited to see that buck as any other big buck. Um, we donated the meat for a program they have there in Kansas called the Hunt for Hunger, where mm-hmm. they have these freezers of meat that anyone can go get meat who's needy, who is in need of meat, can go get meat from these freezers. It's a wonderful program. Um, I beaded that skull and donated it to the Mule Deer Foundation. So I raised money for the Mule Deer. So that's a really special hunt. To me, that's what it's all about. Hunting with good people, telling a good story, donating meat. I mean, that's what it's all about. Right. That's a great message. Absolutely. Love that message. Um, Thank you. The skull painting and beading, that's, how do you find time to do that? (laughs) I mean, that's that's a good question, right? Yeah, as I'm looking around at the nine jobs I have to get to, I'm a little behind on my cell work right now. Um, It's just tough. I always try to tell my customers that I'm, you know, usually six months to a year out. But hey, that's a taxidermist, right? I mean, you know, I'm not any longer than an average taxidermist. But uh, unique jobs come up, too, in the middle where, where it's a neat, unique filming opportunity or story that I might have to push some skulls behind. But it's tough finding the time. I'm, I'm finding myself um, flipping on my skull work here, but it's also, I feel so honored that people trust in me to send me their skulls. Because I don't know about you guys, but I hold my skulls near and dear to my heart. If it's a hunt I've been on or, you know, bear skulls, deer skulls, elk yeah. skull, whatever, they mean a lot to me. They're memorable. And yep. for people to trust in me, to send them to me, to beat them up or paint them, I don't take that lightly. And so it's it's a lot of fun, but it definitely, I, I could use more time in the art studio that's for sure it's it is interesting how you don't want to part with some of these these skulls or pieces of of the deer that you shot and i I, i'm having a hard time coping with the the fact that the turkey that i shot this past season the the beard has disappeared from my garage (laughs) and i think there was a squirrel that took it i mean and that's not even that's not even a big deer but that's that's like a a piece of that animal that i want to remember and it's gone because some other creature took it it's just the way you know and i'm still kind of a little upset about it but what am i supposed to do you know yeah i'd be bummed yeah i hear you so I always know when someone sends me their skull, it typically means a lot. Yes. Now, I also do skulls where someone says, I don't have a skull. Will you beat up a whitetail, you know, for my wife? Or, and I have skull inventory. But when someone sends me their personal hunt, their skull from a hunt, I think it's really, really special. So I try to do a really unique custom job right. for that customer. Right. Uh, you do beautiful work. I've never seen anything like thank it before. You. It's amazing. Um, oh, thank you so much. Jenna, this has been fantastic, and thank you for taking some time to share all the stories with us on the Big Buck Registry. We we love hearing inspiration, all the stories about you know people that are doing great things in the industry and uh, good stewards and and representatives of the hunting industry. And I think you cover that like uh, no other. I think it's fantastic. So definitely, well, thank you. Keep up that great work. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. I don't take this platform lightly. Um, I'm really proud to be a woman in in this industry and hopefully representing really well. And I'm proud to be a hunter. I think we all need to stand real tall, especially right now and in these weird political times that are going on and feeling like our rights are being sort of infringed upon day by day. I think it's important to stand tall. And I really appreciate you guys for reaching out to me and having me on the show. I, I really appreciate it and hope I can come back. Absolutely. You are, here's an open invitation to have you back. You, you, you have a lot of great insight and I like your positions on so many of the things that we care about. So you're welcome back anytime you'd like. Thank you. I'll be back. Cool. Awesome. Thanks again. You bet. Well, Dusty, I, uh, I, once again, I learned something from an aspect, a perspective of hunting that I, I just don't have. And it's just fantastic. I love what Jan is doing with the artwork of the skulls. Yeah, you know, she's putting the uh, beads on the skulls, and it, if you take a minute to check her out there, it's Skullbound and uh, on Facebook, and she actually has got some pictures posted up of where she beaded, beaded the skulls of these uh, phenomenal harvests, and, and anybody can get one done. She does it almost as a living. It's a hobby, but yet, you know, it's, it's turned into more than just a hobby for her, so it's phenomenal work, and she's able to donate a few skulls to some big events and, you know, raise some money for charity, and, and that's awesome. Yep, she's on the Sportsman channel, Skullbound TV. Check her out, skullboundtv.com. Uh, check her out there, and then on Facebook, it's uh, Skullbound. So uh, best of luck to Jana, and hopefully we'll have her back on the show sometime near down the road. Uh, oh, absolutely. You know, we, we welcome you back anytime, Jana. Absolutely. 
I've, I've reached out to Kendall Jones to see if we get her on the show, and I have not heard anything. So if there's anybody, if you're listening out there and you've got a phone number for Kendall, I would love to have it. Shoot me a private message at j at bigbuckregistry.com because I want to have her on the show to tell that story about the antis attacking her and her, her whole Facebook page and all that. That's a story we need to share here on the Big Buck Registry and get to the inside scoop. That's what we need, Dusty. Yeah, absolutely. I agree to that. You know, it's something that it needs to be brought to attention that, you know, there's always a question of why. Why are they focusing on you? Right. Yeah. Why are they focusing on, on you in particular? Right. Yeah. They're, they're really, it's like a group of tigers coming in on some, on some bait, you know, and right. they're really, really getting after. And I, you know, it's something I don't understand. And we definitely need to hear the story from somebody that's getting attacked by the antis. I agree. And we need to kind of band together to help her, I think. Um, I yeah, absolutely. But, absolutely. You know, but first I would like to get that story from her. You know, I, I see a lot of shares going on. I see a lot of jabber about it. Um, but I, I got to tell you, you know, the way we are handling things here at the big buck registry as journalists as uh as media we really need the story first before we can go blasting this off you know what i mean yeah absolutely i, I couldn't agree more to that and we are going to get the story if it's available yeah yeah i agree um so what's uh how can we reach you over at chubby times dust if we want to reach out to you and any get any special tips of the week or anything like that you know i do have a tip of the week you know cool you you got to get some mineral and you got to get some feed out early you know I, i'm a firm believer if you're able to to put out some corn and some mineral for your deer not only is it going to increase your antler growth and, and, you, and your herd's physical appearance and also keep them nutrition at the highest peak level that you can keep it at you know get some mineral get some get some corn or, you know a lot of people's going to chicken land mash I, I just heard this not too long ago it's a uh, high in protein and, and man it's really packing on the antler growth i, I don't understand that. i gotta do some research on that but i've heard chicken land mash is the next new deer feeding product hmm. interesting very interesting hey i just uh i got a, a text here from a griff bate uh, B-A-U-T-E is one of our fans, and we've talked to Griff quite a bit. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing his, his name correctly. Uh, but uh, he wants us to cover the um, National QDMA Convention this year. Really? Mm-hmm. He said he, he thinks we should really get there and talk to Kip Adams. And uh, want, he knows that we covered the Great American Outdoor Show. Right. And that in general, podcasters don't cover conventions like this. And I, I agree with him. I think we should cover this kind of stuff. It's, it's exactly what people need to know. Because when you go to those shows, it's right on the, you get the, what's on the cutting edge of technology and stories and news and um, threats to the industry. All that is right there for you to just grab a hold of and yeah i I agree yeah and it's our job to report on it to get it back out to the masses that can't make to the show i think it's not like a great idea i agree all right so how do we uh how do we reach it dusty facebook.com forward slash chubby tines outdoors very cool all right and just a couple things i'd like to cover if you'd like to send a picture for submission to the big buck registry to have it posted on our wall of fame the best thing to do is to go to www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck, and you'll see all the instructions right there for you to take a hold of. And there are several different methods. I had one person tell me that it wasn't easy, um, which I disagree with because one person out of a few thousand didn't get it right, but um, I'm not changing it, just so you know. But uh, it's all the instructions are there. It sh- gives you an email. You can send it to to us uh and then we'll if it meets our criteria we will post it on our wall of fame we post five a day starting at 7 a.m and uh, work it in throughout the the mix and the criteria that we are looking for number one would be we would like a picture of you and your buck just after harvest if you have additional pictures to send in that would be pictures of the mount or a picture of um like a game cam picture you had before you actually harvested the buck. That's awesome. If you can send all three, that's the pinnacle for our wall of fame. If you send in a picture of just the buck, eh, it's going to have to be one fantastic buck to make the wall. If it is a picture of uh, just a mount, sorry, it's just not going to cut it unless it's one of the most unusual bucks we've ever seen. But that's about it. And if you you must include your first the first name of the hunter and the state of harvest. If you do the state of harvest, hunter's first name, and at least a picture of you with your buck, 
And if you have other pictures of a game cam or a, a picture of the mount for a before and after shot, that's guaranteeing you a spot on the Big Buck Registry's Wall of Fame. That's how Dusty got there, right, Dusty? Absolutely. You know, it just uh, it's pretty simple, and it's pretty awesome if you make the Wall of Fame. That's right. And you will have a moment of fame because you're going to be shown to, in, on average, you're going to be, it'll be shown to about 45,000 people making it into the, the uh, feeds of other people on Facebook. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, that's an opportunity you may never get anywhere else. Yes. And as these pictures come in, we just might ask you to be on the Big Buck Registry to tell your story in a Hunter Highlight. And that's really the only way to do it. Yeah, you reach out to us, and you know anybody sends a picture in that they're taking a chance that they're going to be a hunter highlight right here on the Big Buck Race Your Big right. Buck Podcast. You're going to get to tell your story in your own words on the mic with us, and we'll make it we'll we'll make it nice and easy, and you're just going to tell the whole story like it actually happened, bring you back to that day, that moment in time, like a time capsule. And that's what we're going to do for you. So, uh, what else? Uh, you can go to BigBuckRegistry.com. You can go to our Facebook co- Facebook page, www.facebook.com forward slash Big Buck Registry or twitter.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. Uh, I think that's about it, Dusty. Awesome, man. You know, to just reach out to us. Get a hold of us. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, we'd love to hear the stories, the pictures. Just just let us know what's going on if there's something else you want to hear on the show. Yeah. Um, there's something that's uh, just popping up, an uh, anti-chase snap or somebody else, let us know. You know, We like to know these things. That's right. If you've got a new story that we need to cover, we need to get a hold of these people to tell that story, something unique, uh, unusual. Uh, somebody steals an antler, somebody steals a mount, um, somebody's attacking somebody for hunting or something like that, let us know because we want to get on top of that story pronto. And without you guys, we, we wouldn't have the stories coming in. That's we right. wouldn't have the awesome, awesome tips and tricks on hunting we wouldn't have none of that so that you know we appreciate everybody's info and, yeah. and thanks for tuning in with us yep although we are the ones that's hosting the show uh, i'm sure you have a good effort to keep all this content free for everybody to share and understand and use the day day hunting that's really the boss yeah, absolutely you know, we, we appreciate you listening with us and uh, look forward to next week i'm jay scott well, I'm this is the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. See you next week. Can't wait. Can't wait.